Dear friends, Shabbat Shalom. I begin tonight with the story of King Nimrod. According to the Bible, the first powerful ruler in Mesopotamia. Jewish tradition teaches Nimrod lived during the time of our patriarch Abraham. Not much is written of him in the Bible, but Midrash Rabbah describes him as the archetype of a tyrant. Ravenous in his appetite for domination, he even sought to dethrone God. To demonstrate his supremacy, he fashioned an idol to place up in God's heavens and ordered a tower constructed, the Tower of Babel, to exalt this idol. Nimrod's subjects, mesmerized by the mighty king and terrified of him, built the tower to support the idol and Nimrod's war on the divine. God, though, foiled the plan by garbling the conspirators' speech, hence that name Babel. Because they could not communicate with one another, they were unable to complete the structure which sunk to the depths of the earth. And the people, too, suffered. According to the Midrash, when one builder would ask for a shovel, his neighbor, unable to understand, would instead hand him an axe. In anger, the first would seize the axe and slaughter the second. Thus, not only was the tower destroyed, but so were the people, all because of Nimrod's lust for power. This past week, we beheld the consequences of the lust for power. What transpired on Wednesday was the direct result of President Donald Trump's. His seditious call for supporters to march on Congress and his divisive, baseless claims of a stolen election affront the dignity of our nation and the integrity of the presidency. But what we beheld has been four years in the making. A direct line connects his response to Charlottesville and his incitement in Washington. Some of the same white supremacist ideologies were represented in both mobs as the symbols the rioters carried and wore bore witness. There were very fine people on both sides, he said back then. We love you. You're very special, he said on Wednesday. And don't think this mob will so readily crawl back beneath the rocks the president lifted for them. They believe, because he told them, that an injustice was done to America. They believe, because he told them, that they are great patriots, and they will continue to make their voices heard. The National Guard, that should have been assisting in the vaccination effort, instead needed to be deployed to quell the unrest, which we must see was met very differently than so many of last summer's demonstrations for racial justice. Had this been a Black Lives Matter protest, Capitol Hill would have been armed to the teeth. Even after the mob entered the Capitol building, President Trump continued to assert the election was rigged. But he is not the only one history will judge culpable. His kitchen cabinet, including our city's former mayor, Rudy Giuliani, who called for trial by combat and got just that, and his enablers in Congress, the builders of the tower to idolize him and support his assault on the democratic values of this country, they too are responsible. That eight senators and more than 100 representatives still challenged the election results after order was finally restored is unconscionable. Nimrod may have been the first biblical tyrant, but in this week's Torah portion, Shemot, which opens the book of Exodus, we meet the second. According to Targum Yonatan, another early rabbinic text, the pharaoh of Egypt 
is Nimrod's biological descendant and his spiritual one. He too sees the world only as a platform for his own deification. And just like Nimrod, Pharaoh's thirst for control devastates his entire country. Pharaoh concerned himself little with human suffering. Certainly he cared nothing of the Israelites who were chattel to him. But he was just as cruel to his own people. Consider his response to the first of the ten plagues. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your rod and hold out your arm over the waters of Egypt that they may turn to blood. But when Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood so that the Egyptians could not drink, Pharaoh turned and went into his palace, paying no regard. How does Pharaoh react? He retreats inside his palace. The plague does not affect him. He'll still get his fresh water. His servants will dig it for him. But all of his subjects, they are the ones who suffer. Moses even warns him of the destruction to ensue if he doesn't relent. But Pharaoh does nothing to alert his people. His closest advisors inform him his cause is lost. But he remains so irrational and insecure he will not concede defeat and instead self-destructs. Only when the crops, the livestock, and the land are annihilated and every firstborn Egyptian is dead does Pharaoh finally surrender. Whether through his neglect of the millions sick and dying from coronavirus, medical care for which he had privileged access, or his burned down the house departure from office, President Trump has willingly allowed America and its people to suffer. The only one who could have commanded the nation's resources necessary to address the pandemic, he instead consumed his days in an attempt to salvage his political legacy, which now is sealed for history's judgment. On the same day, our nation's capital was assaulted from within by legislators undermining the democratic process and from without by an angry mob doing the president's bidding, we also learned that Reverend Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff had been elected to the Senate. The next morning, Thursday, my younger daughter burst out of her bedroom excited. Mommy, Daddy, she said, did you know a black and a Jew were elected in Georgia? No matter our politics, we must acknowledge the symbolism and optimism of what took place in the Empire State of the South and in what unfolded in the House chamber a mere 12 hours after the riot when Congress reconvened to certify the Electoral College vote. Though battered and bruised and humbled, the institutions of our democracy proved stronger than the mob. This Shabbat, we pray for the health of our country, physically and spiritually. As Jews and as Americans, we share a vision of what our nation, our world, our lives should be. Martin Luther King Jr., whose pulpit at the Ebenezer Baptist Church Senator-elect Warnock now occupies, captured that faith in his 1964 Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. I believe that what self-centered men have torn down, men other-centered can build up. I still believe that one day mankind will bow before the altars of God and be crowned triumphant. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, 
Thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea.